Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast, brought to you by Mayo Clinic. I'm your host, Dr. Andrea Tooley. And I'm Dr. Eric Bothan. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest in ophthalmology, medicine, and more. Today we are joined by AAO President-Elect and Chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at Dell Medical School, Dr. Jane Edmond. You don't want to miss Dr. Edmond sharing her inspiring medical story, her leadership experiences, passion projects both in and outside of ophthalmology. We're so happy to have Dr. Edmond here today. Dr. Jane Edmond is Professor of Ophthalmology and Neurology and Director of the Mitchell and Shannon Wong Eye Institute and Founding Chair in the Department of Ophthalmology at Dell Medical School in Austin, Texas. She specializes in pediatric and adult strabismus as well as pediatric neuro-ophthalmology. Dr. Edmond is President-Elect of the American Academy of Ophthalmology and past president of APOS. She's joining us today as a visiting professor at Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Edmond. Thank you, Andrea, Dr. Tooley. I <laughs> am so proud and happy to be here and very, very honored and privileged. Well, it's fantastic that you're here and we're taking full advantage of you being a visiting professor mm-hmm. here at Mayo and making you join us on the podcast. Happy to be here. We're so sad that My co-host, Eric, is missing this. His son is getting married, so he has a great excuse. Minor excuse, but we'll have to give him a pass here, so. Yes, and you two are strabismus buddies. Yes. So you know him well. Yes, exactly. So we're sending you our love, Eric, and we miss you. (laughs) Well, I have so many things that I want to talk to you about. I want to talk about your leadership journey, your education journey. I mean, you're in a super niche pediatric neuro-ophthalmology specialty, but you got there in a, in a really fantastic way that I want to talk about. You've founded a department of ophthalmology and a residency, which a handful, uh, if not less, people have ever done, which is incredible. You're president-elect of AAO. You are just an outstanding person inside and out. So there, there's a lot of things that I want to kind of dive into today. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for being here. One thing I want to start, I I think a lot of people know you and know who you are, and they know that you've trained in pediatric ophthalmology and neuro-ophthalmology, but it just blew me away to hear your training story. I think it's Mm. fantastic and very inspiring. So can you just share with the listeners kind of your quick, brief ophthalmology journey? I'm uh, happy to do that. Uh, 1986 is when I started my residency at Baylor College of Medicine, finished in eight, 1989, did a fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology at the University of Iowa, came back to Baylor uh, for about seven years, and then moved to Philadelphia, where I worked at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, for another seven years, and I had a part-time uh, position at Will's Eye Hospital on Friday, staffing a resident clinic, came back to Houston, and I had been so inspired by the multidisciplinary care that I was able to participate in at Children's Hospital of Phil- Philadelphia, specifically the craniofacial clinic, and I learned so much from the, uh, listening to the plastic surgeons, the neurosurgeons, the geneticists, It was very enriching for me and very professionally satisfying, and it became sort of a niche uh, area of interest where I I did publish some and lectured quite a bit in that space. So we moved back to Houston, and there were good reasons for that. I went back to Texas Children's and Baylor. Um, My husband uh, was offered the chair of head and neck surgery at MD Anderson, so he wanted to go back to Houston. My mother's, uh, my stepfather had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and my mom was going to be alone and lived in Texas. So, you know, it was like the forces of nature telling me to go back home. So I got back to Houston and got my old job back. Um, But I was, I got pretty depressed that I was doing more bread and butter pediatric ophthalmology, although I was at a very uh, tertiary children's hospital. It had not grown to the size it is today, and I wasn't so involved in craniofacial care or multidisciplinary care, and I really had sort of burned out of just general pediatric ophthalmology uh, and needed to pivot. And I, I think I had to like totally bottom out and before I made the decision to pursue a different career path. And so I met with Danny Jones, my chair, and I had some ideas in mind. One was to do uh, all the care at our county hospital and pediatric and adult ophthalmology, all the VA care, just just do indigent care because I 
have a big passion for caring for the safety net population. But the other idea was to do, um, which I had, was I had a very big interest in neuro-ophthalmology. And I was also inspired to do neuro-ophthalmology because we didn't know what we were doing in this growing children's hospital. I had a patient go blind from a pseudotumor cerebri that was related to her being um, on immunosuppressives. She had an or, uh, orthotropic uh, heart transplant. And I watched her go blind. Uh, and that is due to our in, my inexperience in neuro-ophthalmology. My training in, neuro in pediatric ophthalmology was so focused on strabismus and in pediatric cataracts and ptosis and nasolacral duct obstruction. We sort of ignored the optic nerve. Um, and so the Children's Hospital is growing in its neuroscience uh, division, and due to my uh, having needing a factory reset, neuro ophthalmology fellowship seemed to be the something that would save me, and it really did save me. It was uh, a renaissance, really, and it uh, began a career in this very niche field. I was able to provide better, much better care to our patients with brain tumors and neuro, uh, neurologic conditions at the Children's Hospital, which was very gratifying to me, working in a multidisciplinary team uh, with uh, the neuro-oncologist, brain tumor specialist. But it took like a burnout to have, to be able to pivot. But it was, it was the, one of the best years. I loved being a fellow. <laughs> that, that just blows my mind. And there's so many facets of that that I want to delve into. I We talk a lot about burnout, career satisfaction, and nobody ever talks about going back to training 15 years into your career. You know, you weren't just a couple years out and said, oh, you know, I, really, I don't like my choice. I'm going to do a different fellowship. You were 14, 15 years out, so mid-career. Correct. How do you convince someone to let, I mean, was it hard to, to let them be your, you be their fellow? Uh, or, I mean, I guess not because you're outstanding, but well, it just, it seems like that would be weird. So it, it was very interesting in that the neuro-ophthalmologist, I wasn't leaving town. My kids are like in middle school and right. going into high school. So I, there is no way I'm going to go away to do a neuro-ophthalmology fellowship. So um, I spoke to Rod Ferusen, who was a neuro-ophthalmologist at, at Baylor. And uh, I knew, I'd known Rod for many years because he was my resident at Wills. Oh, wow. In the Friday clinic that I staffed for, for those uh, six plus years when mm -hmm. I was at Wills. So he did his neuro-ophthalmology. He was a resident at Wills and neuro-ophthalmology at Wills. And uh, he got a job at Baylor. And then several years later, I came back to Baylor to be a pediatric ophthalmologist. And I spoke to him. Um, and at the time, there was no match for neuro-ophthalmology, so mm -hmm. uh, yes, you can be my fellow. That sounds great, because the, on the first day of the uh, fellow, my fellowship, he said, you know, the best thing about you is that in 12 months, I'm never going to see anyone less than 18, mm. <laughs> because he was right. taking care of kids, and adult neuro-ophthalmologists oh, wow. are not terribly comfortable right. with a wiggly right. four-year-old with ADD so and optic So this was great pain. for him. This was great for him. And I would manage, I would do, you know, ampli I'd figure out, I'd refract, do amblyopia treatment if mm -hmm. needed of his patients, and then they'd transfer to me uh, at the end of the year, which is what happened. Oh, that's so perfect. Um, you had to take a big pay cut, I'm sure. Yes. To go from faculty to fellow. <laughs> uh, but I did negotiate with uh, the Children's Hospital like a PGY 50 salary. <laughs> but it wasn't my current, it wasn't the current salary. But, you know, at that point, money didn't matter. Right. I, I think it's so outstanding. You never hear a story like this. But the way you describe it as a renaissance and as a treatment for burnout, a factory reset, like this is all so incredible. And I don't know if anybody would consider, you know, maybe I should go back to training and learn, but what an incredible gift to give yourself. And we, you know, we're natural, ophthalmologists, I think are naturally uh, intellectually curio curious mm -hmm. and uh, lifelong learners anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and this just, you know, I, and I negotiated uh, that I would not have to take, I wouldn't do perform ROP exams or do any diode lasers, which was like manna from heaven for mm -hmm. me. Uh, I didn't take call at the Children's Hospital, but I did sign a contract that I would come back for three years and be a pediatric neuro-ophthalmologist. Wow. Of course, I'm going to do that. My kids are like in 
middle school and high school. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was good. I think this just really goes to show that if if something's not working in your life, you can create the life that you want. You can dream it and write it and make it. You know, this was not a path that was already set forth. You designed it and you wrote what you wanted and made it. Yeah, but it did take a burnout to get there. So yeah. hopefully this has taught me and maybe can teach others that you don't have to reach the sort of the depths of despair before you figure out how to dig out. You can do that prior to the the nader. Yeah, but it's a great perspective that you have having known, you know, I'm sure you have such a deep understanding of career satisfaction and what that means and what it means to be part of a healthcare system in lots of different ways. And I'm sure you apply that. I'm going to kind of transition to talking about now your role mm-hmm. as chair of the department, but building a department from the ground up. What is that like? <laughs> How do you even start? A lot, when I hear you talk about what you've done, how you've created a department, you've hired faculty, you've designed and built your department, just like you designed and built your dream job and your fellowship experience, um, you designed and built a residency program. In my head, I always have the thought, how do you learn how to do that? What books do you read? Who teaches you that? Like, how do you learn these things? Do you just learn on the job? I, I have to know because I always think I could never do that. You yes. know, I just, yes, I, I don't could. have the the business acumen or I'd, I'd have to read every, you know, business book, health, health CEO book, healthcare, business, MBA book. You know, I'd need an MBA to do that or whatever. So so tell, tell me everything. Well, so I felt the same. So when I was um, looking at the position and I was, I, I looked at, I investigated the job because I was asked by someone on the search committee via a friend of mine in Houston. Um, uh, the search committee was not entirely satisfied with the comp- with the group of applicants to the positions. So the this- position meaning they Dell Medical School wanted someone to come and build the ophthalmology department. Correct. Okay. Uh, and the applicants to this inaugural chair position, someone on the person on the search committee, mm-hmm. actually the the head of the search committee, the lead on the search committee. Uh, indicated to a friend of mine um, at a retina meeting that um, there, the search committee was not entirely satisfied with those who had applied. Mm. And they got to talking, and my friend said, "Have you, it sounds like you want somebody like Jane Edmund. And this, the person on the search committee will tell me a little bit about her. And then I get a call about a day later. Um, ha, do you know about this job, this new, this inaugural chair position of the Department of Ophthalmology? And yes, I had known about it, but I knew of other chairs applying for the job. I had never been a chair or a vice chair or a program director, and I'd held a lot of you know leadership positions in professional organizations, but never something that I thought was the absolute requirement mm-hmm. on, on you know a, the springboard into a chair job so i didn't apply because i didn't think i would be considered uh, but they were looking for dell medical school was looking for somebody different and not your traditional uh archetypal uh chair person that Mm -hmm. was maybe more, I think they were looking for somebody more democratic and less autocratic, somebody who had coming into the position without experience so that they could innovate. Mm -hmm. What, 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 how can we make it better? Mm -hmm. What, uh, not somebody that came with ingrained, this is how it's done. This is how I did it. But somebody who's never done it who free thinks, how could it be better, in how, what I, how I have witnessed it, but not something that was ingrained in this is how I do it or how we've done it. Mm-hmm. So um, I applied for the position and I got the job. But I think not having had the experience was actually beneficial. But so I asked friends, you know, can I do this? Like I have never had just like you, I don't have an MBA and uh, what books do I read? Mm-hmm. And I mean, I don't know, never done any of these things. 
I know I'd be a pediatric neuro-ophthalmologist, but that, you know, that's going to be like 30% of my job contracted to Ascension. What about the other 75%? And the la- I was told by David Park, the last time somebody has done this in the history of academic ophthalmology was maybe 40 years ago, wow. try- trying to do both things at once. Um, so I talked to colleagues, and many of them have been on the board, Russ Van Gelder, um, Tim Stout. Steve Christensen, uh, other chairs. Oh, and I'd be like, I can't balance my checkbook. What do you think about me overseeing right. finances? <laughs> oh, just hire somebody great. Uh, your department administrator, you can uh, hire an accountant or somebody who's been there. You, you've got this. You have the personality. Uh, people respect you. You have integrity. Uh, you have a democratic style, which is not the autocratic style that we were kind of raised in, or mm-hmm. many of us were. Mm-hmm. Um, that's so not, common in medicine. So very common in medicine. Um, that is not the way leadership trends are going these days. Mm-hmm. Um, you already naturally do that. Um, you empower your, you know, your residents and all the fellows and residents you've trained, and um, supportive of your. Uh, the, your reports, uh, the staff and and uh, trainees. So yeah, you you can do this. Okay, that it that it took that encouragement uh, for me to actually apply. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I understood the mission of Delmed and the vision that the inaugural dean Clay Johnston set forth of serving a uh, being a inclusive health ecosystem, including our robust community partners in physicians, for me, ophthalmologists, into our department, into caring for a community of of the broad spectrum of the community, safety net population, fee-for-service, that really appealed to me. So, um, yeah. It's it's really wonderful what you're doing. I hate this question when anybody asks me, but I'm going to ask you anyways, because I'm so curious. Have there been elements of the job that have been surprising to you or things that you didn't expect that were more challenging than you thought, or you just didn't, didn't even come to your radar that like, oh, this is going to be the bulk of the work. It didn't even occur to me. Uh, Like, what are the, what are the things you don't think about? Well, it was drinking from the fire hose. Mm -hmm. Only 30, that 30% of the time, did I know what I was doing? That was when I was in clinic or the OR. But right. the rest of the time, I had to go, you know, how do I get, how do I hire, how do I post a job position? Well, you go through this process. And then that changes in six months. Mm-hmm. So there were, you know, it was a lot of drinking from a fire hose, terror incognita. But looking at all of those challenges, what well, one of the easiest things was actually recruiting like-minded faculty. Mm-hmm. That was probably the most enjoyable because I'm a people person but finding people who had my same vision that were here to train amazing residents create leaders create socially conscious residents provide incredible care evidence-based care to a broad you know population of people have a mind for safety net population that that actually was the easiest once I finally get the job positions posted. So the, the bear, what was surprisingly difficult is the bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. You know, a, uh, UT Austin is the school. We're a college within UT Austin. You know, I graduated from there. I don't totally bleed orange yet, but pretty <laughs> close. Um, established in 1888, and I swear to God, some of the policies have been the same since 1888. <laughs> Working with vendors is very difficult because there's these indem- uh, you can't sue the state of Texas or they won't be something called indemnification. So we've had difficulty like uh, establishing an optical shop has been impossible with an outside uh, with an mm. outside contract because of these ancient uh, bureaucratic barriers. The, med- the college, UT Austin, doesn't entirely understand having a medical school. So uh, collaborating and integrating, especially when science to, in scientific endeavors has been slower than mm-hmm. I thought it would be. Um, but that's definitely improving over time. So those were some of the more surprising barriers. Yeah, things you don't even think about. Yeah, and HR rules your life. 
finance rules your life. Yeah. Like, you know, even though we have a very magnanimous gift that established the department accessing that money. Uh, it's all about the money. <laughs> yeah, it always is. It always <laughs> is. Well, as if you don't have enough on your plate, you're building this department, building a residency program, and then the American Academy of Ophthalmology nominates you to be president. <laughs> what is that like? I, I think that a lot of people don't know how the hierarchy of academy works and you know the difference between the CEO or the president or what the role of the president is. Like, t- talk to me about your role as president-elect. What do you get to do? What does that mean? What's your platform as president? Like, give us the whole academy spiel. Well, uh, as president-elect, so uh, the terms begin in January. So I'm, I'm, I'm five months in, mm. so I don't entirely know the, uh, the whole reporting structure with the president and uh, CEO, who's amazing, Stephen McLeod. Um, but I can see from Dan Bryceland's hit what he is doing in his role as president, and that's directing focus toward certain topics and certain issues with obviously with obtaining advice from Stephen. Mm-hmm. So both Stephen and Dan, for the first time, there have been these uh, super national meetings like the Asia Pacific. Uh, both of them attended, and there was so much excitement from the attendees about the academy representation and the academy people who were there. Uh, it brought led them to consider how can we bring more academy wealth to these international members? So how can we deepen our engagement with our international members? So that was led by Dan and Mm -hmm. um, Stephen, uh, but was Dan's, that was his sort of passion project, I think. So uh, since terms turn over in January, uh, my, I would like personally my passion projects and we'll see how they play out at the academy level um, uh, is a topic that I, session I sponsored at the mid-year forum and that was uh, riffing off of the health disparity papers uh, that came from Paul Lee's task force uh, that had a bunch of sub-task forces to uh, examine health inequity, health disparities in in the ophthalmic space. And I've always been very passionate about indigent care and part of the reason I took the job in Austin is uh, when I was interviewing the sole ophthalmologist that cared for the hospital district insured patients lost uh, the hospital FACO equipment, was thrown out, I think, and he had nowhere to operate these patients. There was a waiting list of 300 patients with Mm. visually significant cataracts. I'm like, that cannot happen in Austin. Mm -hmm. I am burning to go fix that. So, the, that work and how so how do we raise social consciousness and awareness amongst our members how and how uh, what what about providing a pathway as to how to imp, in, get engaged in care of that safety net population I mean what are the tactics and provide sort of a blueprint or pathway I would love to do that I mean it's obviously you can't support a practice on Medicaid Uh, 100% Medicaid patients, but um, maybe in my position at the Academy, I can help work on providing avenues for our members. And the other is the, another passion project is the workforce shortage and impending to be worse in pediatric ophthalmology, Mm -hmm. neuro-ophthalmology, and uveitis. So that has been a topic of uh, great conversation at the last year's AAO retreat, which is a summer retreat, uh, and often in the president's vacations, uh, uh, some city or location that's uh, dear to the president, and it's a a working retreat with lots of blue sky blue sky activity uh, that uh, comes out with you know, the summary of an, and a pathway of what should be done, but it's always topic driven. Um, Behind the scenes at the academy, we have the most, not that I have a lot of experience in other academies, but certainly in uh, APOS, another professional organization, which is also terrific, but at the academy level, you can sit in a room with five staffers, Mm -hmm. academy staff, 
and count up their years of experience at the academy, it could be 120 years. Yes. yes. We have the most committed, mm-hmm. amazing staff. Yes. And the culture they, ha- they have built, like, be- you know, probably before Dunbar Hoskins mm-hmm. and w- before David Park. Yeah. Uh, before so Stephen McCutt. They've all been there 30, 40 years, all of them. And that it's- just tells you how amazing this culture yes. is. Yes. So f- to be part of that... Uh, it just uh, is illustrative of mm. this is a terrific organization that's um, value-based, yes. that is accountable, um, is doing the right thing by our, our patients, mm-hmm. advocates for our patients and our members, that they're con- continuing to pivot and grow and do things right for for uh, their constituents, which are, which are our patients and our members. So. That's the behind the scenes look. That's what I've known all along. Oh, I love that you said that. It's true. I mean, the Academy is the real deal. And so much of it is run by the staffers, like you said, and the culture that they've built. That's that's really wonderful. Well, congratulations. Thank you. It's so exciting. And I mean, it is kind of a three-year term. You're president-elect year, you're president year, and then you're past president year. So you're just starting. It's very Correct. exciting. <laughs> yes, I agree. So another, you talk about passion projects and um, blue sky things and um, some of the the things that are forefront in my life as a young mother, a young ophthalmologist, a working woman in medicine um, is balancing family life and managing that. And one of the big blue sky topics that I brought to the YO retreat, um, you know, not the Academy President retreat, Mm -hmm. but our our young ophthalmologist retreat was uh, providing childcare at our meeting at our annual meeting and that's happening for the first time this year we're so excited that is all done by the academy that wasn't me that was the academy it's unbelievable but the idea came out of your yo work it was it was highly supported by the yo's but but really across the board with the academy they've been so receptive and and they had it before they had child care years and years ago and then it just kind of went away and so they've they've brought it back this year for the first time in San Francisco so we're very excited about that. Nice. Um Congrats. yeah, well, thanks. We're excited because I think if you want young ophthalmologists to be engaged, then you have Agreed. to support the phase of life that we're in as young ophthalmologists. In early training, we have young kids. We're focused on our family and and if I want to be engaged in ophthalmology, I have to bring my family. Correct. That's just how it goes. So, but you are I'm I mean such a leader in this space. You have a two, two physician household. You're both superstars, you know, your husband, chair of head and neck at MD Anderson. Oh, my gosh. And then look at you. Well, so, he's now uh, phasing out uh, as I uh, ramp up. He's uh, ramping down. So that actually uh, was helpful that we're both not on working 10, 12 hours a day. You're uh, kind of taking turns with yes, your career. That's correct. But ha- come now that you're on this side, your kids are, are grown. You've gone through it all. You know, you've been in the trenches with young kids. What what would you say to young ophthalmology listeners? You know, like if I was listening to this, I think I want to be just like Dr. Edmund. I mean, I do. I want to be just like you. So wh- what? how do you get through those times? So many people are in two physician households. Like how do you make it all work? I, um, if I could talk to my younger mom self, mm-hmm. uh, working, uh, I was working full time and then with fir- first two children that were 19 months apart. <clears throat> but then, um, as my husband had always had the vision to become a chair, like, I don't know, since babyhood, mm-hmm. certainly since he was uh, an otolaryngologist in training, um, his work was increasing in importance importance and in the hours and after the second child I felt if I was not home at six o'clock I would burst like my heart would burst Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, work didn't always allow that he was not at home uh, because his uh, his efforts at work were increasing so I felt that I needed to work less than full time. Mm -hmm. And so when we moved to Philadelphia, I had two days a week that I got to pick the kids up from school. And then I did this volunteer position at Will's Eye Hospital on Friday. So it wasn't a a 1.0 FTE. And uh, not many ophthalmologists, like I didn't know a single ophthalmologist that did this. And when I uh, began uh, in Philadelphia, 
I had a very short stint at a children's hospital that was not a children's hospital of Philadelphia because they had not didn't have a position in the budget. And I started this uh, children's hospital, lots of uh, hospitals in the area. And um, I was known as the part-time doctor, part-time physician. Oh, you're the new part-time physician. That's how I was characterized. But it was worth it because my, my heart didn't ache anymore, but I felt really guilty. Like my scholarship was, no, was not on that trajectory. It was flattened out. And I remember going to sleep at night uh, thinking, you know, uh, where's my, I, I was getting amazing clinical experience, great surgical experience. And then I was at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which I was so happy being there, but still kept that same schedule. Um, you know, I'm getting these great clinical and surgical experiences, but I am not going anywhere. I, my scholarship is not really where it should be mm-hmm. to become tenured, uh, to get uh, promoted in a timely way. Yeah. And I felt really badly about that. So I would tell my younger self, chill out. Mm-hmm. There are so many phases of life especially I think for caregivers uh, me as a I wanted to, my husband could have worked less uh, less than a hundred and twenty percent but I had to in my heart and soul be with my children more and I did that for about uh, eight to ten years and uh, I would tell myself do not go to do not wake up at 3 a.m feeling guilty enjoy what you have you there's always time in your career that you can ramp up and it it's not going to stop your uh, your career trajectory once you get back into it full swing that's what i tell my ears and delegate <laughs> don't go grocery shopping yeah. have somebody make your food you might have to fix it but have somebody cook for you do don't do any house cleaning um Take your, don't feel compelled to take your kids every, every ride, you know, uh, mm-hmm. delegate that out as well um, so that you can spend more quality time with your kids and, and still participate in your career. Oh, man. I love the real advice you just gave. That was so real and necessary. And mm-hmm. I think people sometimes kind of beat around the bush, but that is fantastic the permission that you just gave so many of us. I hope, uh, I'm glad to provide that permission. I've not given it to myself as readily, but Mm -hmm. I wish I had taken that advice earlier. Wow, that's absolutely outstanding. Dr. Edmund, it's been such a pleasure. It's over. It's over. (laughs) I think so. I think we'll wrap it up. I mean, I could talk to you for two more hours, but I think we'll wrap it up. Um, Thank you so much for being here, really. It's a true honor. You're just outstanding and inspirational in so many ways. So thank you so much for taking the time. And Dr. Tooley, thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. And uh, thanks to our viewers and uh, have a great day. You too. Thank you. You can find all episodes of the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast on our website. Thank you for listening. And we definitely look forward to sharing more. 